So I noticed this new game on Game Pass where you get sent to hell and need to drink Satan under the table in order to get resurrected to the world of the living. So obviously I checked it out and immediately the art style looked really familiar to me. Turns out it's made by Night School Studios whose only other game, Oxenfree, is also on Game Pass and I've just finished playing it. So it's time for a double review. So let's start with the first game they made. Oxen Free starts on a boat where high schoolers Alex, which is you, her lifelong best friend Ren and her new stepbrother Jonas are traveling to a remote island to get drunk and be merry and such. Once there, they meet Clarissa and Nona who were expecting more company but everyone else bailed because they got too drunk the night before. <laughs> Classic. Oxenfree's art style is what initially drew me in. Cute 3D character models walk around beautiful hand-drawn landscapes and there are these neat little speech bubbles that pop up whenever someone's talking. But what kept me playing was the dialogue, which is what Oxenfree is built around. You can quickly tell that Ren has a bit of a crush on Nona and Jonas feels awkward as the outsider in the group and Clarissa and Alex have some unspoken history. Either that or like, Clarissa is just a total like, bitch, right? Sorry, sorry, sorry. The dialogue is woven between characters to really create smooth and authentic conversations. Rather than the usual pick your answer and wait for the NPC to finish talking, you can interrupt them to get your point across. Wait too long and you might miss your chance, leaving someone else to continue the conversation for you. Or you can choose just to say nothing. During conversations, thought bubbles will pop up with a character's face in. It's a subtle nod that someone has said something meaningful, but it's left ambiguous as to whether it's good or bad. It's just enough to remind you that your words have meaning. This adds a layer of complexity to your decision making which I really love in a branching narrative. I have no idea how much dialogue I missed from choosing to interrupt people at certain times and keeping quiet at others, and I often found myself wondering after I'd made a decision how things might have played out differently. After playing Truth or Dare to break the ice, Ren insists on going to a strange cave that he says reacts to certain radio frequencies. Venturing into the cave, you accidentally open up a portal to another place or another time and things start getting really weird. Everyone gets split up and you have to regroup to close the time warp and get off the island. It might sound like the plot from a teen drama and it kind of played out that way for me, where the time travel stuff is more like the backdrop for interesting character development and relationships that go on. But there is a much deeper story to Oxenfree if you're willing to play through the game multiple times and spend that time tuning your radio into the audio tour of the island. From 1941 to 1972, this communications tower served many different telecommunication functions, including point to point from its receivers. Which, yeah, it, that's about as fun as it sounds. Uh, or turning it to other frequencies to find hidden clues. I've only played through the game once and I will play it again to see how much my decisions can affect the outcome but I wasn't keen on immediately picking up the controller again, as moving through the island can be a bit of a chore. It's only 5 hours, but Oxenfree doesn't feel like it goes at a quick pace. There are moments when it feels like you're walking through treacle, and I felt in desperate need of a sprint button, which is only made worse by the fact that in certain areas, Alex will sprint, or well, it's kind of a light jog, but you can't decide when that happens. And sometimes the character animations feel a touch samey, like jumping across a gap or climbing the ledge looks pretty identical. When each character is so distinct in how they talk and act, I kind of wish they could have extended that to how they move. The closing moments of Oxenfree add a nice twist to the story, but what mattered to me was that by the end I had made friends with Jonas and been the matchmaker for Ren and Nona, but I had alienated Clarissa because, you know, she is a bitch. But actually, uh, the second half of the game explained the reasons why she was standoffish. My attempts to make up with her came too little too late. So when I play through Oxenfree again, it won't be to try and understand the game's murky plot, but to see if I can build bridges with my friends. Man, the ending got pretty soppy there, didn't it? Well, enough about that anyway. What about the game where you can grab a pint with Satan? Oh my god, Nola, we're dead! We're fucking dead! 
there's a god! <laughs> there's a god and we're dead. After Party tells the story of Milo and Lola, they're two recently deceased college graduates that have wound up in hell. Getting some level of emotional control, at least. Oh my god, Milo, we're dead. We're fucking dead. And we are in hell. How oh, is this not hitting me before? We are in hell and we are dead. They aren't necessarily bad people. This is just a version of hell that you can be sent to for using the self-service checkout when you have more than 10 items. It's a grungy underworld where demons torture humans for all eternity, but only during the hours of 9 or 6. Once you get off work, both Hell's victims and its employees will usually spend the night at the local pub, or party up at Satan's place. Milo and Lola get to human processing just after 6pm, safely avoiding their first day of torture. Trying to figure out how they died and why they're in Hell, they wind up at the Strangler, and it's there they realise that they can return to the world of the living if they're able to outdrink Satan. It's also where you realise After Party has added another element to the choose your own dialogue style of Oxenfree. In Hell, if you get drunk enough, you'll unlock a third dialogue option. Ah, <coughs> uh, goes down smooth. Now you should notice you feel a little empowered, right? Maybe a little freer? Or if you have eyeballs, you'll notice you have an extra choice floating around in your brain. You can order a variety of drinks at the bar that will affect you in different ways, giving you unbridled confidence or seductive prowess, or making you talk like a pirate. It's where all the best jokes come out, watching people react to the stupid things you say. He's got another thing coming. I can see straight down on that asshole's head from here. Great. How does that help us? I'm a living symbol of triumph! Milo, what the ah! fuck are you- Drunken conversations add yet another layer to the night school's already excellent dialogue system, and I thought this was gonna be, you know, the secret source for outdrinking Satan and his gang. Drinking the right cocktail in order to wordsmith your way through the game. You can shoot down a pretentious asshole with sarcastic wit, or intimidate a bully with incandescent rage, or fit in on the dance floor because you drank literally acid. That kind of thing. One glass filled with literally acid, if you please. Take the first drinking game you do, for example, which is a match of beer pong. Before you start up, you're told, hey, it's, it's not about winning, it's how you react. It's like the game is telling me, don't worry about whether you actually get the ball in the cup, but focus on roasting your opponent in imaginative ways. And that's what most of Hell's residents are best at. Posts on Bicker, which is Hell's interpretation of Twitter, confirm this. Someone says, I look like a Cabbage Patch doll grew up and became a heroin addict. <laughs> whether you win a beer pong or not, you're commended if you came up with some witty insults along the way. Tell me the truth. When you were born, the condom manufacturer had to issue an apology, right? <laughs> but the only thing the drinking element really changes in After Party is what jokes you can say. Then there are other times where I think After Party just got in its own way a bit. Sometimes I'd be moving too quickly and a line of dialogue would be overlapped by the next. You also control both Milo and Lola at different points in the game, but switching between them seems to happen basically at random. I often chose a response thinking I was Lola, only to have Milo start talking, or vice versa. There are also moments where the game slows down to a crawl. There's the same problem Oxenfree had of forcing you to walk through certain sections. But also, taking the wrong turn can lead to a 30 second walk towards nothing. You know, usually if you veer off the main path, it's for a bonus or an easter egg of some description, um, but several times there was just nothing there, and I had to run, well, no, I had to walk all the way back. I gotta say as well that playing it on the Xbox One was a real struggle at times. There were some really bad frame rate drops, mostly when you were travelling from place to place during this taxi segment. Like I genuinely just take a blank loading screen over this, to be honest. It also happened during a quick time event dance-off that made it impossible to match the rhythm, which was annoying. 
Um, and this was also a another example where I was hoping I'd be able to talk my way into getting this guy's approval by fitting in um, drinking literally acid. But I ended up impressing him by winning a dance-off instead. Which I mean, fair enough, look at those moves. Damn. Go, son. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. 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 Oxenfree is fantastic because of its dialogue, which made up for a slightly unimaginative story. I'm sure a more serious fan of the game will tell me that's just me not understanding the plot, which might be true, but I mean for the average gamer, which I certainly class myself as, I was more interested in the character relationships than where the sentient time-warping triangle things came from. After Party has a fantastic story that takes place in a hilarious and well-crafted world, but the dialogue just didn't connect with me in the same way. It made me laugh a lot, don't get me wrong. See you on the other side, kids. You, uh, you want to get in on this? Sent you to the wrong carpal tunnel. Whatever. Sorry about that. But I felt that I was pressing a button to decide which joke I wanted to hear, not to decide how the story unfolded. That culminates in the ending, which kind of just sputters into a series of monologues rather than the big drinking game you thought would be the climax of the story. Probably because the drinking minigames are actually really easy. And I do like the meta-narrative behind the game's conclusion, which can go one of two ways, but the message is pushed at you in such a way that it makes the right choice quite obvious, and I felt more like a passenger than a participant in the final outcome. Oxenfree and After Party both rely on their dialogue. Well, I think I've said that like five times now, okay, you get it. Um, if I'm to compare the two side by side, I think Oxenfree captured the natural flow of conversation better. After Party suffers from occasional pauses when people talk to each other, which, I mean, is nothing compared to most choose your own dialogue games, but having literally just played Oxenfree, it was noticeable. Mr. Wormhorn here is your personal demon. That being said, I think I enjoyed playing After Party more, even though it has more flaws, if that makes sense. Hey, when the premise hits, it's a funny game about getting pissed with demons. How, how can you say no to that? Ultimately though, both are definitely worth playing and I can't wait to see what Night School Studio come up with next. Okay, thanks, bye.